stop. Okay, so here we go, lecture six. We're gonna pick up where we left off, talking about um, the Peloponnesian War, the conflict between Athens and Sparta, and the aftermath of that conflict. Here we go. Okay, so first of all, where we last left off in lecture, we were talking about um, the aftermath of the Persian invasion. So we had just gotten through the, uh, the end of the second Persian invasion. That happened in 480 BC was the second Persian invasion. That was the huge one led by Xerxes with the huge army. And uh, it ultimately was decided, if you recall, uh, by a naval victory, the, vi the Battle of Salamis, which was, of course, spearheaded by Athens. And then there was a mop up um, at uh, that final battle. at Plataea. So after that, the second Persian invasion comes to an end, just like the first one. Uh, the Persians go slinking back into their own territory, and the Greeks are yet again victorious. It was unclear whether there would be a third Persian invasion or not. Also, there was a lot of damage that had been done. Uh, Athens itself had been burned to the ground. There was all this need to recover. So that's where we left off last time. This time, we're going to talk a little bit about how that process uh, had a huge effect on the politics of Greece itself. Uh, first off, we mentioned last time, I think, the development of a mutual defense naval alliance called the Delian League. It was originally uh, voluntary, and uh, different city-states would put up ships and crew in order to participate in kind of a coast guard to uh, prevent Greece from being an easy target in the future. And it was spearheaded by Athens and organized by Athens. And then Athens had the best shipyards, and Athens had the best um, crews, and Athens had the best expertise for naval strategy. And so it happened relatively logically enough that the money that the Delian League was raising for a mutual defense of Greece ended up being funneled into projects that Athens found important. And that's going to be very significant down the line, uh, because Athens doesn't exercise as much restraint as they might have. Instead, they start using this economic leverage in order to make their own lives quite a bit more comfortable than they had been previously. So this is where we're picking up today. If you were an Athenian citizen in the decades following the sec second Persian invasion and the rebuilding of Athens, this was a boom time. There was lots of cash flowing in. There was lots of interest. There were lots of travelers. The economy is booming. Everybody's got a job who wants one, either in the Navy crewing these uh, Delian League ships or as builders and laborers. Everybody is working and they are building the city back lavishly and beautifully. If you are a citizen, uh, life is reasonably good. Um, they have a, the closest thing that has ever existed in history to direct democracy, meaning that important issues are decided by vote. Uh, people who vote in the assembly are getting their jobs by lottery. Um, and it, it, it because they have approximately, and this is according to ancient sources who are not always super reliable on numbers, approximately 40,000 citizens in Athens after the second Persian invasion. It fluctuates because the city itself was destroyed and being rebuilt, but about uh, 40,000 or so was the estimate. Now that sounds like a really small city, a small community, except when you consider that citizens actually represented a relatively small slice of the overall population. Because in order to count as a citizen, you had to be number one, adult, uh, number two, male. Uh, women did technically, you could call them citizen women, but they were uh, not allowed to vote, not allowed to hold any public office, not allowed to speak in public, not allowed to uh, even offer testimony in court cases. Uh, their lives were quite restricted and they didn't have any of the sort of rights and freedoms that uh, a male citizen would have. So uh, when I say 40,000 citizens, I mean 40,000 uh, are adult and men and uh, official citizens of Athens, residents of Athens, and are not slaves. They couldn't be a slave. And uh, you had to have official citizen status. And in order to qualify for official citizen status, originally, Athens's rule was that you had to have one citizen parent. And so if you had one citizen parent, then you automatically were 
given Athenian citizenship and you would be entered into the lottery to serve public office. You'd be able to vote, you'd be able to sit on juries, all of that kind of thing. At this point, because a lot of people wanted to jump on the train and become citizens of Athens, it was more restricted. So you had to have two citizen parents in order to count as a citizen. What that meant is that it didn't matter how long you lived in Athens if you moved there. You would never count as a citizen. You'd never get to vote. You'd never get to have a seat in the assembly. You'd never get to have an equal say over the government. Uh, even uh, if your kids were born in Athens, it didn't change anything. Because you're not a citizen, your kids can't be citizens. And so you have generations of families who live in Athens, sometimes for two, three, four, five generations, and none of them count as citizens. They live there but don't have the same legal rights and protections. Those people are known as metics, M-E-T-I-C-S, metics. Um, those people are metics. And so uh, there's quite a few of those, um, perhaps as many as 100,000 metics in the city, as well as uh, the other people who don't count as citizens, children, women, slaves. And if you add all of that up, it could be as many as 300,000 or 400,000 people. Athens gets to be quite a big city by ancient world standards. They're supporting themselves with trade and they're supporting themselves um, with their colony cities, their daughter cities around the Mediterranean, and they're supporting themselves by being able to leverage uh, their connections with the Delian League to bring money in. And this is working better than it ever has before. If you are one of those citizens, life is good. You've got easy opportunity for work. You're getting paid relatively well. Your life is very comfortable. And you are able to uh, enjoy an unprecedented amount of control over your own political destiny as well. That being said, I need to caution you, this is a direct democracy, which means everybody gets a vote um, and you have an equal opportunity to uh, sit on the assembly and be a part of the government itself. But Athens does not have anything like a Bill of Rights. It doesn't have individual guarantees for citizens. So just like they can ostracize somebody just because they voted to kick them out of town, there's nothing protecting you legally. If the majority decides that you're a threat or a danger or a problem, they can do almost any action against you and there's no guarantee or, of protection. Okay, so uh, even though everyone technically enjoys free speech in Athens, anybody can say uh, whatever they want, unless you're a woman, in which case you're socially uh, blocked from being able to speak in public, uh, and you're legally blocked from being able to speak in the assembly or in court, um, even though all men can say what they want to say, if they offend people too badly and they end up getting exiled, they end up getting exiled or they end up getting killed or whatever else happens. So Athens is a high stakes kind of game. <laughs> all right. So that being said, uh, there's a few uh, elements just to point out. They rebuild the Acropolis lavishly, uh, building the fabulous Parthenon, which we'll talk about in just a second. Uh, they're going to uh, invest very heavily in other features of the city, the gymnasia, which is the place where people go to exercise and compete and it ends up being kind of a political kind of like the golf course where you'd go to do political deals and talk to people as well um, and there's a big amphitheater where everybody can go and enjoy religious festivals and um, various other uh, the performance of plays which would usually be part of religious festivals they do have games as you can see the foot race being captured there on the one base uh, as well as uh, flourishing cultural life during this time they give out very uh, large cash prizes for winning um, competitions for poetry and playwriting and various other things it's a flourishing cultural time for Athens This largesse, this comfort, does not extend to Athenian women, however. Athenian women uh, could occupy a variety of different statuses. If you were uh, a citizen wife uh, in Athens, your life was, as I alluded to just a second ago, quite significantly limited, both legally and socially. So some of this is just social expectation, but some of this uh, really reflects legal restrictions as well. 
Um, citizen wives were not really full citizens in a, a technical legal sense. They were considered to be minors, like children, uh, to have the same status as children their entire lives, uh, no matter how old they got or what their marital status was or anything along those lines. So they were not allowed to offer testimony in court cases on their own behalf or behalf of anyone else as witnesses. They were not uh, permitted to control their own property. They could inherit property, uh, but just the way a child can inherit property, they're not allowed to administer it themselves. That always had to go through a male um, guarantor, a male person who was in charge of them, either their father, their husband, some other male guardian they'd be put under the control of if they didn't have one of those other two. Um, they also were not allowed to attend a lot of public assemblies. Um, they were allowed to go to the marketplace. Um, they were allowed to move around the city. However, the expectation for a citizen wife, uh, a person who was respectable or respectable lady, would be that even that would be highly restricted. Respectable women were expected to stay um, in private spaces most of the time, either in their homes or the homes of their female friends, perhaps, or the homes of their female relatives, and that was it. They were expected if they did move around, they went shopping. This was possible, but you had to have a chaperone and go attended. Um, there's some debate over whether they were expected to be veiled and cover their faces. Uh, it's not really clear in Athens or not whether that might be the case out in public. Um, they were really expected to severely limit any interaction they had with men other than their children or their husbands. There was a small list of, of male relatives like your father, your brothers. You might be like, to see socially, but that was it. Other than that, you were not expected to mix with really any men at all. And so women would be given, they, it's not that they didn't have responsibilities, they'd be given in charge of the household, often in charge of the household budget, they'd be expected to manage the servants, they'd be expected to care for and do the sort of primary education of children, they'd be expected to run all of that, but they were expected to confine themselves to their homes. They were not allowed to participate in the government in any way. Uh, they were not allowed to vote. They're not allowed to uh, give any kind of political speeches. They're not even allowed to uh, have parties or meetings where they have their opinions known. Uh, in the case, we have several des to descriptions of Athenian households. The expectation of a respectable house. If you're very poor, this wouldn't apply to you. But a, the expectation of a respectable citizen house would be that it would be divided between a men's area and a women's area. And that if you were to go over, if you were a man, to go visit your buddy, uh, one of your friends, your male friends, you would not expect to even lay eyes on his wife. Uh, she would be expected to stay away in the kind of private part of the house. And uh, then you would entertain, if you were a man, uh, your male friends in the public part of the house. So uh, women's lives were quite restricted. There was a very short list of places they were even allowed to go. They were never allowed to go anywhere kind of alone or unaccompanied. This was just a, would be a scandalous thing and they weren't allowed to do it. When it came down to their, their legal status, uh, they could be divorced by their husbands at their husband's instigation for any cause at any reason at any time more or less. The only thing that could possibly uh, impede their husband from doing this is if he was afraid that their family, her family might become offended and possibly retaliate against him. But basically, he can just kick her out anytime he wants. If a woman wanted a divorce, she could not initiate divorce proceedings on her own. Uh, she would have to contact a male relative. Uh, and this did happen occasionally, but she would have to go to her father or her brothers or somebody who was a male relative and get them to initiate divorce proceedings on her behalf. And there was a very short list of reasons that this case would even be heard that she could legitimately file for divorce. If she found out her husband was a horrible criminal of some kind, or um, <laughs> there was basically not a lot of ways to get out of a marriage if you were an Athenian woman. And while married, she, as I mentioned earlier, was not allowed to control her own property. And so that severely limited and restricted her ability to do anything because she's financially completely dependent, either on her husband or on her male relatives. And so she really is going to end up living a highly, highly restricted life. Now, if you are not a citizen wife, if you were one of another type of women who lived in Athens, and there were large numbers of them, 
your life could be quite different. Um, there were large numbers of prostitutes in Athens. There was a lot of work being done. It was a boom economy. And, and there were a lot of prostitutes, both male and female, that worked in Athens legally. This wasn't a problem in the ancient world in general or in Athens. Uh, and they kind of came in a couple different categories in Athens. There was the standard sort of streetwalker, hire them by the hour prostitute. And these were known as the porne. So pornography is pictures of prostitutes. Um, that's what the word means in Greek. Uh, but there was also an interesting class of women that kind of rose up out of this deficiency, out of the social gap that was left by isolating and excluding citizen wives. Uh, this category of women is known as the hetaira or the hetaire, plurally. And the hetaire were closest to, uh, the closest, I guess, I thing you might be familiar with is like a geisha, they were courtesans. They were uh, prostitutes technically, but they weren't the higher by the hour kind of prostitutes. These were really high class and they typically uh, entered into contracts with single men. So well, not that the men were not married, they usually were, but they would have a client, not multiple clients. So they'd be basically hired as kept women or mistresses on the side. Not all of them had exclusive contracts, but many of them did, and that's how they made their living. So they were kept women. They wouldn't necessarily be paid by the hour, but a man would pay for their house and their lifestyle and buy them gifts and things like that. And the Hetaira, intriguingly enough, were the most highly educated women in Athens. The rest of Athenian women, if the citizen wives, could be uh, educated if their families decided they wanted to do that. But generally, uh, their education went to kind of primary school level and really nothing beyond that. It would not be at all surprising that, a, that an, a citizen woman would be able to read and write and do some math. But it would be highly surprising if she was educated in anything that you would consider advanced. She didn't know anything about broad economics or politics that she was kept strictly away from or uh, philosophy or anything along those lines. Lines. The Hetaire were quite the opposite. They were highly, highly educated. In fact, one of the most famous Hetaire, uh, a lady named Aspasia, was uh, the mistress of one of the leaders of Athens, Pericles. We'll get to him. And she famously got into debates publicly with Socrates and won, which is why we don't have recordings of those debates. <laughs> but they would be highly educated in philosophy, in literature. They'd be highly educated and often very talented in uh, performing arts as well, music, dance, things like that. And the purpose of these hetaire was that they would be companions so that you would hire them. And then if you wanted to go to a party with all your buddies, if you were a, a well-to-do and obviously only rich men could afford these ladies, uh, you would bring your... Uh, your mistress with you. Your wife would stay at home and you would might be meeting at the house of a man whose wife was just staying in the wife quarters of the house and you'd bring your fancy mistress with you. Often these parties would be attended by porne as well, but that's a whole separate issue. But um, they would be expected to conduct a scintillating conversation and hang out and be part of the entertainment like a geisha in a sense. And so it's like an odd situation in Athens. Legally speaking, it is highly, highly restrictive and exclusive of women. It keeps them very much um, shut out of any kind of political or largely social power. Not that they had none, but it was highly limited compared to basically everywhere else in the ancient world. There's nowhere in the ancient world where there's anything like equality between the sexes, but Athens is probably the worst out of all the cultures we're going to talk about in any detail. Things were much more equal in Egypt. They were more equal in Mesopotamia. They're going to be more equal in Rome. Never equal anywhere, but more so um, than in Athens, which was the absolute worst. I mean, you could make an argument for Sparta too, I suppose. But um, nevertheless, there is, is a place where it was closer to equal, but that's kind of a grim equality because as I mentioned last time, Sparta didn't have much in the way of freedom for either men or women. All right. So that being said, that's the situation, generally speaking, on the gender side. Now, back to the general uh, discussion of Athens. It's boom time, they're building, and that building is lavish, and they're squeezing their alliances in order to get the extra cash they need for all of that. So here we see, these are the ruins, uh, the poor thing, uh, the Parthenon. It's in the high city. 
the Acropolis in Athens. This is what's still standing there on the left in this big picture here. You can sort of see those those bright colored dots um, on the front of the building there. Those are people to give you some sense of the scale. Um, the sad thing about the Parthenon is a lot of the damage has been done in the modern world. It was smashed up uh, pretty badly in a series of wars in the uh, early 19th and early 20th centuries and exploded by bombs. And it was very unfortunate. But um, even what's just left of it it is a monument. It's one of the most highly developed examples of classical architecture, as it's known. Uh, the thing was a, a gorgeous temple dedicated to Athena at the top of the city. It uh, occupied not just an important ritual uh, place in Athenian life, but it also housed uh, the armory and the treasury. Originally, the, th the Parthenon was enclosed and it had big doors and a roof on it. And so uh, it was the safest place in the city. And so it was the place where they housed the city treasury and the city uh, armory as well, all their extra weapons and things they might need in the case of war. And this also was the place where the Delian League was expected to bring their tribute. Every year, they had to load up their carts and wagons with the treasure that they had to pay into the Delian League to qualify as their, as their share, and then haul it to Athens at their own expense, and then haul it through Athens in their wagon, winding all the way around the Sacred Way to deposit it at the Parthenon. And the Parthenon itself was glamorous. It was glorious. And if you take an art history class that talks about the ancient world, no doubt you'll cover it in just lavish detail as it well deserves. The whole thing is just a, a miraculous achievement of this type of style. Uh, for instance, just to give you some example of how skilled the architect was, there's this weird uh, kind of optical illusion that happens if you're standing below a building that has is built totally level and on straight lines uh, in that it will look kind of crooked because of the angle you're approaching it uh, if you were approaching the, the Parthenon. This was corrected by the architects of the Parthenon so that it would look straight while you looked at it from below. The same thing is done with the pillars. The pillars aren't actually straight. The pillars are kind of bulge a little bit in the middle and it gives the impression that it's all beautiful, even, parallel, perfect uh, thing uh, is an optical illusion. And then it was decorated in beautiful friezes. If you wanna know what it actually looked like originally, There is a full-scale model of it uh, that was constructed in Nashville, Tennessee. So you can go down and check it out once things calm down and people are not all covered in COVID um, in Tennessee. I wouldn't recommend it right now. But um, yeah, what you can go down there and see it. It's a life-sized, full-scale replica of the Parthenon so that you can see what it would have looked like back in the day. And it is absolutely gorgeous and you can see some of the elements are preserved in this replica that many people don't realize first of all the statues of ancient greece and rome we picture them if you picture them now as white 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 everything is white because that's what it looks like now after millennia of aging and being in the sun and being worn down and being damaged but at the time uh, many of the Building faces, statuary, and various other decorative pieces were all painted bright colors once upon a time or painted to look like lifelike skin tone so that a statue would look like a person, like, you know, the, the same sort of colors that people's hair and eyes and whatnot were. So it would have looked starkly different. And it, it really is a very different image that you that you might otherwise have gotten. So anyway, this is what the outside would have looked like. But what really like got the goats of the people of the Delian League, Athens, after some years of collecting this tribute and putting it to its own use, they justify it by saying, we have to rebuild Athens because Athens is going to be the cornerstone of any defense against Persia. Obviously, it needs to be rebuilt. And so obviously, we're going to have to build big walls that protect our harbor. I'll show you a picture of those in just a few slides. Uh, obviously, we're going to have to build um, better streets through the city. Obviously, we need a, a strong and uh, secure treasure 
treasury at the top of the Acropolis. Obviously, we need to revamp it, our temples to keep the gods on our side. Obviously, we have to do all of these things for mutual defense. Well, it wasn't all that obvious to the members of the Delian League, and they start to get mad about it, especially since anytime somebody tries to get out, Athens takes their pull with the fleet that they have built and equipped and crewed with their own Athenian citizens and then just goes and uh, leans on that city. Sometimes they will outright attack them. Sometimes it's just threats and forces them to stay in and forces them to keep paying and leans on other city states and leans on other little island communities to join the Delian League and pay into this. And so Athens in essence creates an empire and not only do they create it, but they totally rub the member states' nose in it. They force them to come to Athens anytime they have a dispute originally it was just like if you have a dispute with Athens or a, an Athenian citizen you have to come to Athens to have that court case heard then they the Athens begins expanding their demands so anytime two dealing in league states have a, a dispute with each other it has to be heard in Athens which means everybody has to travel to Athens even if they don't live near Athens and travel in the ancient world is expensive and time consuming um, and dangerous they have to travel there they have to stay there they have to spend money in Athens they have to bribe Athenian juries they have to generally and those Athenian juries by the way because they can be as big as any citizen who wants to show up and be on the jury because that's how it works in Athens um, that means that uh, the juries can show up if it's a dispute that has some impact, if it's a dispute that the outcome would matter to Athens, that dispute is always decided in favor of Athens. That's just how it works. So Athens is really throwing its weight around. And they don't try to hide it. They make people bring their tribute. This is the inside of the Parthenon, where there was a 40-foot tall statue of Athena. And because they were so rich, and because they had so much more gold than they needed to spend, and because they had some sense of economics, I guess, where you realize that you don't want lots and lots of gold in circulation or it, it diminishes the value of the gold, uh, Athens decided to Fort Knox style keep a gold reserve but rather than just keeping it in boring old bricks or coins or something in the back of the room they decided to take their gold reserve melt it down and cover the 40 foot tall statue of Athena with it and then demand that all the Delian League member states continue to show up every year and drop off their tribute so they had to huck this stupid treasure all the way to Athens, then go all the way up the sacred way, which is this long kind of winding road that climbs all the way up the hill of the Acropolis, go through the doors of this gorgeous brand new temple, and look at a 40 foot tall statue covered in gold in order to drop off their yearly contribution. You can probably imagine the sheer resentment that was building up. Okay, so the Delian League is increasingly angry. They're getting more and more frustrated with Athens, bullying them, pushing them around, controlling their policies, and generally squeezing them for every penny they have extra. And so life is not 100% uh, certain at this point. Athens feels, and they're fairly confident, they have a good grip on their allied states. And so if you look at this map, all of the kind of bright lemony yellow, these are all uh, Athenian allies, and the kind of little bit darker mustardy yellow is places where there's Athenian allies as well. And uh, the sort of paler part is where Athens really has a chokehold over uh, the city-states and their economy and their foreign policy and all of their uh, general international behavior. They really have these places locked into the Delian League. And if you look at the map, you're like, wow, that's a huge amount of territory. But what you might not be noticing and seeing is just how ambivalent, how uncertain many of those places are that they really want to be allied with Athens. And that's going to come back and bite Athens in the butt because if you look at that pink area, that kind of uh, pinkish brownish zone, 
Sparta is not really 100% thrilled with this uh, situation either. Even though they had worked together, Athens and Sparta, to fight against the Persians, Sparta has never really gotten along well with Athens. Sparta has that strange uh, government that is like that highly militarized um, thing. There really isn't a modern equivalent, so I can't put a name to it. It's kind of like an oligarchy, I guess, except that it's not really based on wealth. It's based on their position in this weird military hierarchy. It's kind of like communism in that they're discouraged from private property or making any individual decisions, except that it doesn't uh, support the working class because those are all helots. It's really just weird. But Sparta feels really kind of threatened about it and is weirdly defensive about their odd way of life. And they feel particularly threatened by strong advocates for democracy, for the idea that every person should have say over their government. And Athens is absolutely gloating about this. It's weird and kind of hypocritical because Athens points to itself and says, look how great Athens is. Look at how great life in Athens is where all of our citizens have say in the government where everything is going great and our economy is working great and all of our beautiful temples and buildings and gymnasia and amphitheaters and look at how beautiful it is and how gracious it is and how great life is in Athens but of course they're paying for all of that with money from places that don't have any representation they're paying for all of it with the Delian League funds. And on top of that, they're ignoring the fact that citizens in Athens represent something like 10 to 15% of the population in Athens. Because if you're not male and adult and the child of citizens, you don't count. So you had this big population of, I mean, half of everybody is women. And then on top of that, you have um, children, well, they're going to uh, grow their childhood, but you have women, you have medics, you have slaves, you have people who happen to be resident in Athens that are passing through. So the city uh, is only being represented by a small selection of people. It's just that they come from every economic class, I guess, except for slaves. So it's interesting, but Athens talks a big game and they talk about the importance of democracy and Sparta absolutely hates this idea. If you've ever been misled by movies like 300 into thinking that Sparta cares about freedom, they care about not being conquered by Persia. That's accurate enough. But they uh, are a culture that totally relies on slaves, the helots, and slave labor to do basically everything in their economy. And they are absolutely violently anti-democratic. It's not how their government works. It is absolutely not about any kind of personal freedom in Sparta. Uh, people don't have the right to choose their education. They don't have the right to choose uh, their job. They don't have a right to choose their spouse. They don't have a right to choose anything in Sparta. And so Athenian talk about individual liberties and the right to do what you want doesn't go over well. They don't like Athens and they don't like Athens becoming increasingly powerful with the Delian League. So they start creating what's known as the Peloponnesian League as a balance. Now, Sparta's great military strength is their hoplite phalanx. Everyone in Greece uses the hoplites, uh, but Athens leans much more heavily on their navy as the core of their military. Sparta leans more heavily on their army. That's where they excel, and that's where they're better than everybody else, and so they play to their strengths. And they begin building up allies and alliances and expanding their military readiness as well. Tensions just build and build and build. There is a bunch of complicated stuff that goes down that you don't need to remember the details of. But basically, it's inevitable. What's rising between the two of them is just this military escalation where both sides, Athens is looking at Sparta and the Peloponnesian League with suspicion. The Delian League is kind of half on Athens' side, half uh, looking to rebel, looking for anything that's going to set off a war. And then Sparta on the other side is eyeing Athens with suspicion, and they're ready to go as well. So in 431, it kicks off. The Peloponnesian War is going to erupt between Athens and Sparta. The actual origin of the conflict is, as I mentioned, complicated. There was a dispute over colonial territory and daughter cities, and there's a whole like trade agreement, and it just was really complex. But basically, Athens and Sparta go out into direct war, conflict with each other. And initially, it looks a little bit like this is going to be something of a stalemate. The Spartan hoplites are indisputably superior on land, 
but they're tethered to Sparta. They can only stay away from Spartan territory for a limited amount of time or the Helots will rebel. And so they're kind of stuck with that. And then also they have a limited ability to strike at Athens because in the years between the Second Persian Invasion and the Peloponnesian War, Athens had built really big long walls, and that's what they called them, the long walls, that circled the city of Athens and then ran from Athens down to the harbor and circled the harbor as well. So the only real way to strike at Athens, because they can't get past these walls, it's not the kind of like warfare they're prepped for and have the resources for, the only real way to strike at Athens is to surround the city and wait them out and put them under siege. And they, this is going to be tried, but Sparta has a problem with that because they can't stay away from Sparta with much of their army for very long. And so what Athens does, in effect, is they create this kind of safe harbor for themselves. Their navy is much, much stronger than Sparta. Sparta does have one, but it's minor. Um, and so they basically are controlling the sea. Their troops can go wherever they want to. They just sail there. Um, and so the two sides kind of have these opposite strengths. Sparta kind of lays in wait, hoping they can catch a lot of the Athenian army uh, unawares. And Athens' goal, and this was their original strategy, is to fight a war of attrition. They don't want to face Sparta in one big decisive battle. Instead, they send out their army, pick at weak places, places where there aren't very many Spartans stationed or where they can catch just like a small uh, group of phalanx uh, traveling past or go after Sparta's allied cities and burn them to the ground while Sparta's back is turned and just kind of pick and pick and pick and pick and pick. Knowing that it's much harder for Sparta to recover losses. If Athens can just swoop in, burn the place down, hop back on the ship and sail away, then that damage is very costly and time consuming for Sparta to rebuild. If they can take out one hoplite phalanx, it's hard to train people. People have to be born and they have to get to the right age and then they have to be trained to replace that phalanx. Uh, it's much easier to replace the crew of a ship that's lost if you happen to have lost a ship because it's relatively quick to train rowers. Now the people who actually steer the ship and the people who come up with naval strategy are a lot harder to replace. We'll get to that in a little bit. But rowers, it's just a question of conditioning. And there are a lot of Athenians who can do it and they can come from any class and their equipment is extremely minimal. Unlike the equipment of a hoplite soldier who has to have a chest plate and a helmet and a shield and a spear and all of that costs a fortune, uh, a rower, I mean, the boat is very expensive, but a rower doesn't even need shoes. I mean, they really don't need to be very well equipped at all in order to do their job. And so there's a bigger pool of people that Athens can pull from to man their ships. So this is the conflict. It breaks out. Athens' original plan is to fight this war of attrition, pick, 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 pick at Sparta, and then just wait, just wear them down to the point where they have to give in. It's not a bad plan. And it was spearheaded by this guy named Pericles. He's the strategos or general in charge of Athens. And he comes up with this whole idea of how they're going to work this. And it seems like a really good plan until Athens has had to retreat inside its long walls. Now, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. They're not in a seriously dangerous siege situation because the harbor is still open and they still have access to. So they can get in and out and bring in supplies all they want. But the problem doesn't end there if you have a siege situation. If everybody crams into a city and is hiding behind walls, and it's a smaller territory than people usually live in, you've set yourself up for a position, a situation that is ripe for disease. And that's what happens in Athens. There's a plague that hits Athens and a bunch of other cities, but it hits Athens especially hard because their conditions are ripe for it. Everybody's crammed in together. And it very likely... There's a little bit of dispute about exactly what it is. Uh, there has been some attempt to do kind of DNA uh, recovery of some of the remains that have been dug up. But it's really old and quite broken down. Uh, but likely it might have been, and it could be more than one thing that was active at the same time, likely it was some kind of a typhoid disease. So typhus or something along those lines that is spread uh, partly through contaminated water. And that's a huge danger if you have a siege because everybody's using the same wells. And if the well gets uh, contaminated, then uh, everybody gets sick. 
And the plague does hit Athens incredibly hard and people die in large numbers and everybody gets sick. And if you remember what the Iliad had to say, when plague and pestilence start striking people down, it gives you some insight into how the Athenians reacted to that. They were deeply demoralized and freaked out. It was seen as a sign that the gods frowned on them. It didn't go over well at all. Pericles himself, the strategos who came up with the whole, let's just fight this war of attrition business, is is going to die as a result of the plague and it leaves them kind of rudderless for a while they continue their own strategy they don't give in uh, but it really hits Athens very hard and they feel very uh, deeply shaken up by it and so it really makes the war stretch on a lot longer than it might have otherwise. It gives Sparta a little bit of hope that they might eventually prevail and it puts Athens kind of at a disadvantage. Now, one of our readings for uh, this week is a speech that was given by Pericles of Athens and then written down, you could say recorded, but I think it's probably fairer to say paraphrased uh, by Thucydides, who is going to be a historian who writes the history of this conflict, the Peloponnesian War. So we're going to talk about that when we talk about our reading. Now, fast forward, we'll tell you how the war goes, at, goes down. All right, so... Basically, Athens hangs in there. They don't quit. They don't give in. They don't surrender, even though they're deeply demoralized. But the war stretches on. It's going to last about 30 years. It stretches on, and Athens continues that policy of pick, 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 picking at Sparta. It seems to be working reasonably well until 406 BC at the Battle of Arganusi. There was a conflict between Athens' ships and their enemies. And in the course of this conflict, uh, the commanders of the ships maneuvered around in such a way that they were able to win a victory, to defeat enemy ships, get the upper hand, and uh, come out on top with relatively low losses, except that this strategy ended up stranding two ships. So two Athenian ships were left kind of stuck and isolated and alone. And they were stranded and they ended up uh, dying. The, the ships went down, the crew dies, and it was a terrible tragedy because it's a lot of people on each of these ships. Now, the battle was won, and those ships were sacrificed in order to get the upper hand strategically. It was the right strategic move. But when the naval commanders return to Athens and tell them what happened, we won the battle, but sadly, two ships had to be sacrificed, and that was pretty sad. The Athenian bull, the Athenian assembly, flips out. And there was a lot of grumbling and a lot of pot stirring among those who were politically enemies of the naval commanders. Naval commanders tended to come from upper class households because that's the kind of person who has the money and effort and time and ability to seek expertise in order to learn how to be a naval strategist, which is not an easy thing to learn. And there was a lot of anger and uh, basically just frustration expressed in the Athenian assembly, which was populated, remember, by people who got their job by lottery. Uh, these, this is true democracy. Um, and they were convinced that these naval commanders, these admirals, had made a terrible mistake, that they had done this deliberately to sacrifice these people as though they didn't mean anything. And so they were condemned roundly all over the place and eventually actually put on trial for treason, for having turned their back on these crews and left them alone, and convicted and then executed. Now, again, I want to emphasize this can happen in Athens because there's no legal individual protections for people. There was nothing stopping the government from doing this. They just decided that these naval commanders had done such a bad job. It's not unprecedented if you were a military commander that failed. Uh, but even though they won, they, it was decided they had done this terrible thing, made this horrible moral choice, and therefore are to be executed. So they were convicted and executed because they had left these two crews behind. Now, this is, without a doubt, if you had to point to one terrible mistake Athens made, this is it. Naval commanders are not easy to replace. They're really valuable. Even though the ships are still there, even though the crews are still there, uh, the, uh, the process of fighting in a boat in the ancient world involves 
this really chess-like positioning and it's even more than like chess but it's this three-dimensional positioning of your ship in such a way that you cut off your enemy so they can't maneuver but you can and it involves timing it's really just complicated and hard to learn and so if you take eight eight of your best naval commanders and execute them take a guess what that leaves you with not a heck of a lot in terms of military naval command Sparta is in an excellent position to take advantage of this. Lysander, that's the guy on the very left there, is going to petition for the help of uh, a patron, shall we say. And I guess the slide gives it away, so there's no suspense here. But uh, he petitions for help and money. Sparta had never had the kind of navy that Athens had. Nobody had the navy that Athens had. Just like nobody had the army that Sparta had, nobody could match Athens' navy. But now, Athens' navy is vulnerable. And so Lysander is going to draw on the resources of an ally that he has made in his frustration with Athens. Bum, 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 bum. Persia. Remember how Persia was still mad at Athens and they were looking for a way to get back at them, but with the whole Delian League, they can't get across the sea, so it didn't seem like a good bet for them? Well, Persia sees this as the opportunity to strike back. And so they're going to finance and support Sparta in building a bigger fleet and manning it with people who know what they're doing. And so they're going to bankroll Sparta, give them the ships that they need. Sparta is going to encounter Athens at the Battle of Aegospotomy and defeat Athenian forces. They're going to crash through Athens's navy. Athens is forced to surrender in 404 BC. So once this is done, this horrible war has been stretching on and on. It's been going on for a long time. Athens is beat down. They've, their navy has been crushed. Sparta wins. They come sweeping into Athens. And as a condition of the surrender of Athens, Sparta demands that they get rid of democracy in Athens. This is not popular, as you might imagine. And instead of the democracy, Sparta insists that Athens installs the 30 tyrants. The 30 tyrants is an oligarchy, so a rule by the wealthy or a rule by the uh, noble is what oligarchy means. And here's the cool thing, or the, the important thing, I guess I should say. It's not really cool. Um, here's the thing with that. Uh, the 30 tyrants are not drawn from Spartan supporters from elsewhere in Greece. They're not drawn among Spartans and put in place to rule over Athens. No, the 30 tyrants are Athenian citizens of wealthy backgrounds who were handpicked by Sparta and agreed to serve in this role. They agreed that they would be the force that overthrew and sat in place of the democracy. This is really important because it is going to fundamentally shake Athens's faith in their own population. The fact that the 30 tyrants were not foreigners put in charge over them, but actual native Athenians, people who had up until that point been saying, just like everyone else had been saying, democracy is great. Democracy is what we support. Democracy is the only system we like. Even if it meant, if because if you were a rich person, democracy was not necessarily great for you. Athenian democracy in particular, where every institution was set up to limit the ability of wealthy people to interfere and uh, corrupt and subvert the course of the government. So that's why uh, places in the assembly were chosen by lottery. That's why a whole bunch of jobs were chosen by lottery. That's why they paid jurors in Athens. It's the same reason that, I mean, well, they started paying people to sit on juries. Remember, any Athenian citizen can go and sit on a jury if they want to. Uh, so you have juries of thousands of people on any given day. Um, and they made it possible that those juries could be made up not just of wealthy people or people paid by wealthy people to go sit on a jury, but by any kind of working class person by making sure that people who sat on the jury for the day were paid a stipend in order to defray the cost of losing that day's work. We do something like that now, but it's really just a token. Um, I'm not sure. I haven't been on a jury ever, um, and I haven't... It's been a long time since anyone I know closely has sat on a jury, but I think it's something like $20 a day, maybe, depending on what court you've been called to do jury duty for. Enough for like parking and lunch, maybe, 
So it's not nothing, but it's, it's not a real incentive to want to be on the jury. And predictably, when you pay people $20 a day to be on a jury, nobody wants to do jury duty. It's annoying. It's disruptive. You may be losing the, the, the wages you would have made during that day, especially if you're working in a, a sort of a, an hourly wage job. Nobody wants to do it then. Now, what that was the case in ancient Athens too, and how they got around it was by paying people to sit on juries as much or slightly more than the average laborer would work in a day, would earn in a day. So instead of being the equivalent of like $20, they were being paid the equivalent of $150 or $200. Now, if they were paying $200 a day, you can probably imagine how many more people would be just delighted to get jury duty summons and would be just pleased because in Athens, they don't have to summon you at all. You just hear that there's a court case. And so you trundle yourself down and volunteer. I don't have anything to do today. Let's get paid. Um, and so you can imagine how this made it much more appealing for average people or poor people to show up as long as they're citizens to be on the jury. This kind of system was set up in Athens over and over again. The ostracism election, all of this was designed to keep wealthy people from leveraging that money into uh, more political authority than the other people of Athens. It's, it's meant to keep it democratic. And so this whole time, wealthy people very much had been chafing under the system in Athens, where uh, they were frequently being called upon to pay for things, public buildings, uh, extra ships, that kind of thing. Uh, but they were not given extra political authority. They were not given extra control over the government. And they weren't 100% pleased with that. But they had to say they were, otherwise they'd get ostracized. So uh, now that the 30 tyrants were in place, they're like, ha, we're the 30 tyrants now. And the sort of, dis the, the illusion was pulled aside for a lot of Athenians. And they were shocked by it and deeply uh, alarmed by it because they thought things were going a certain way. They thought everybody was on board. They thought the Delian League was all loyal and backing them up. And it turns out it didn't play out the way they were imagining. And one of the places you can see the backlash. Now, the 30 tyrants last less than a year. And there's going to be an uprising and they're going to restore the democracy. There's nothing Sparta can do about that because Sparta can't stay away from Sparta for any length of time because of the helots. So they've had to go home. And once they're gone, it's easy to just overthrow the 30 tyrants and restore the democracy. But the new democracy that is now in charge in Athens, is deeply shaken up by the whole thing. They are worried that there are other people who weren't part of the 30 tyrants, but were maybe 30 tyrant adjacent, friends of theirs, associates, people who are also wealthy, who might still be plotting, who might still be a danger to democracy. And it's in this mood that Socrates gets arrested and put on trial. Now, Socrates' story is a complicated one. Um, he's an interesting figure. There's a whole like mythos around him, legends that kind of grew up after his death. It's hard to know uh, with 100% certainty what his biography uh, actually was like. We have some good idea, uh, in part because Socrates himself doesn't write anything down. He is a philosopher. We'll talk about the, what that means in just a second. He is a philosopher, somebody who loves wisdom. And he leads this really kind of odd life in Athens. And at the time he's put on trial in 399 BC, he has been doing it for decades. He's always lived in Athens. He's always been doing his philosopher thing. And the people of Athens have tolerated up until this point. But in this new mood where everybody's worked up about the 30 tyrants and the whole losing the Peloponnesian War, suddenly he's considered a potential public enemy. So he's put on trial for atheism, not believing in the gods, and uh, for corrupting the youth of Athens. So he, just as a spoiler, he is going to be convicted um, by one of those huge juries. It was actually a big jury trial. There were thousands of people in attendance. He was convicted and sentenced to death. Now, he himself leaves no writing behind, but his favorite pupil and most famous pupil, 
Plato does. He writes down a lot of what Socrates says. Uh, it gets a little complicated because Plato will sometimes use Socrates as a speaker in his own work. And so it's sometimes hard to pull apart what's Plato's ideas and what's Socrates' ideas. But Plato gives us an account of this trial, in fact, where he talks about what Socrates is accused of and what he says in his defense. And this is what's known as the apology. In ancient Greek, apology just means defense. It doesn't mean uh, an admission of guilt or that he's sorry or anything. So uh, there's a record of what Socrates said. And there's a record of what happened in the trial. And amusingly enough, if you have a bleak sense of humor, more people voted after hearing Socrates' speech uh, to execute Socrates than voted to convict him. So there must have been people at the trial who thought he was innocent and then voted to execute him. It's a funny thing, but <laughs> I don't know. I find it somewhat funny. But at any rate, Socrates is, we'll talk a bit about the apology in our reading discussion. And so we'll get into some of the details of what it says. But he himself was a provocative figure his entire life. So Socrates had to defend himself against the accusation and suspicion that he was something called a sophist, which was deeply unpopular in Athens at the time. And what a sophist is, is a professional teacher of the skill of rhetoric. Rhetoric is the uh, process of making a good and convincing argument. And it was popularized by a guy named Gorgias. And he was originally from Sicily, Syracuse in particular, the city of Syracuse in Sicily. And he traveled to Athens and made quite a living for himself. What a sophist did, basically, was it taught somebody how to make a convincing argument. This was really valuable skill in Athens because everyone is expected to speak for themselves. So if you wanted to convince people in the assembly to vote for whatever side you supported, you had to stand up and give a speech about why your side was the right side and convince the rest of the assembly with 500 members in it to vote for you. If you wanted to get this, a lot of popular support for your opinion, you might travel to the Agora or uh, marketplace um, in the middle of the day while people are shopping and give a speech so that you would talk to whoever happened to be there, citizens doing their business, you would talk to whoever happened to be there and get them excited about your idea so they would then go talk to their um, assembly member and get people to vote for it. If it was a direct vote, you would influence people directly by going down in public and giving these speeches and convincing them to vote for your side. That's really how you got things done. And if you uh, found yourself in a court case, for instance, if you had been accused of something, you had to give a speech to, to convince people that you were innocent. So the skill of being able to make a persuasive speech is highly, highly in demand. And uh, Gorgias raises this to a high art. And he would demonstrate to people how how good he was at it by giving uh, demos along the lines of this, where he would uh, be approached by a prospective client that says, I understand you're teaching people how to make persuasive speeches. And Gordon Jess says, yes, I am. Watch this. And they'd go to the, the Agora and Gorgias would stand up and he would give a speech on one side of an issue. I think the, the newest road works should go from east to west away from town. And he would give this speech in such terms and in such a convincing way, using every trick he could come up with to manipulate the emotions of the audience, to make the, them think what he was saying was reasonable and right, to get them so worked up that by the time he was done giving his speech about whatever issue he had taken on, people would be shouting and stamping their feet and practically in tears with excitement about how he was right and that's what they were definitely going to do. Then the next day, Gorgias would go back to the marketplace and different people would be doing their shopping and whatever else they were doing in the marketplace. And Gorgias would give a speech on the opposite side of the issue. I think the latest road works should go from north to south away from the city. And then he would get people so worked up using every tool of emotional manipulation and every reasonable argument and every kind of trick to convince people that what he was saying was right that they would be yelling and howling and stamping their feet and moved to tears by his arguments and be absolutely fired up to vote for that side. 
And so his client would get to see this, that no matter what side he chose, the tools of making convincing argument, the tools of manipulating the crowd are the same tools. And so if you master those, whatever side you need to defend for whatever reason you want to defend it, whether you're right or you're wrong, you can get people to do what you want. So as you can imagine, if somebody's good at this, he ha will have clients lined up a mile long, wrapping around the house, waiting to hire him to teach them how to do this trick. It was, an, it was something that was enormously in demand. But even though there are plenty of people who are happy and delighted and anxious to hire somebody who can teach them how to do this kind of thing, the great majority of people can't afford it. A sophist is somebody who's working, who's doing this job professionally, teaching people how to make good speeches, convincing speeches. They're not going to teach just everybody. They're going to only teach people who can pay and they're going to charge pretty handsomely. And so that means that the great majority of people can't afford sophists. They're just going to be making up the crowd who gets manipulated. And the democracy in Athens was highly sensitized to this idea already that rich people are out to manipulate you. So as you can imagine, there is not a lot of public good feeling toward these sophists. The average, common, great majority of Athenian citizens was deeply suspicious and resentful of them. Like these jerks are out to subvert democracy. They're out to manipulate people into making poor choices just because it's the benefit of their client. Um, and they're out to teach rich people how to do that. And so when Socrates is accused of being a sophist, uh, this is a very deliberate effort to stir up the common people of Athens against him. Now, Socrates' story uh, is more complicated. There's a whole legend about him, and so I suppose I'll, I suppose I'll tell you now, and that way we can pick up on this a little bit in our reading discussion as well. The legend of Socrates goes that he was a guy who was just an ordinary person living in Athens, and um, he one day was minding his own business when a friend of his came up to him and said, Socrates, Socrates, I have uh, this interesting experience that happened to me. And Socrates said, oh yeah, what's that? And his friend said, I went to the Oracle at Delphi. Delphi was a place sac sacred to Apollo where there was a temple and a priestess that claimed to speak as an oracle, the mouthpiece of Apollo, and would speak directly from the god. And if you ever needed advice about anything, everybody went to the oracle at Delphi to see what the oracle would say before they embarked on whatever um, venture they were considering. And the oracle usually gave kind of these vague answers, so standard oracular. So for instance, there was a very famous example where the king of Lydia was debating whether he should join up with Persia or fight Persia when the emperor of Persia was pushing on his borders. And so he sent a messenger to Delphi to ask what he should do. And the, and the oracle responded, said, if you fight against Persia, a great empire will fall. And the king of Lydia is like, awesome, that's going to be great. I'll fight then. He fights and he's crushed and he loses and he's despondent afterwards. And he sends a messenger back to Delphi going, what? What did, why? You lied. This can't be right. How could the God have lied? God doesn't lie, apparently. Apollo. Um, and the oracle said, I didn't say which empire. Now that's what you typically expect from an oracle. But in this case, Socrates' friend gone to the oracle of Delphi and asked a question. Who's the wisest man in the world? And the oracle said, Socrates of Athens. And he's like, well, okay, that's pretty straightforward for an oracle. And he goes back to Athens and he tells Socrates this. And Socrates is like, what? That doesn't make any sense at all. It must be true because the oracle never lies, but I don't understand that because I'm completely stupid. I'm an ignoramus. I don't know anything about anything. I, I can't possibly be the wisest man in the world. That doesn't make any sense at all. So I, I better figure this out. So Socrates goes to Every wise person, everybody who's got a reputation for wisdom or for being clever or for being smart, he goes to priests, and he goes to politicians, he goes to anybody who's got a reputation for cleverness, and he asks them questions. So for instance, he would go to a priest and he would ask them a big broad question like, what does it mean to be pious? And the priest would give him an answer. Being pious means that you do what is beloved by the gods. But then, Socrates would ask, 
follow-up questions. Well, aren't there many gods? Yes, there are. Do the gods always agree? No. So what if the situation arises where you're doing something that is pleasing to one god but displeasing to another? Is that pious? And he would ask follow-up question after follow-up question after follow-up question until the person he was interrogating realized that their answers really weren't that strong and that what they thought they understood, maybe they didn't understand as well as they thought they did. And they'd get confused and then go off and huff. And these interactions are recorded by Plato, his most famous student, in a series of dialogues. Some of them probably really happened with Socrates. Some of them were just made up by Plato after the fact. But regardless, this is the kind of interaction Socrates had. And it did seem to really be what he was doing. He was having these interactions with people. They aren't quite debates, but they're kind of like questioning sessions where he examines somebody's assumptions. That's what the Socratic method is. It's where you don't give a discussion about what you yourself think is true. Uh, instead, it's a way of teaching by asking questions where you ask somebody what they think, and then you ask them questions to expose any flaws in their reasoning or uh, kind of holes in their logic or anything along those lines. So Socrates had this reputation for doing this, and it became kind of like a dare in Athens, where if you thought you were pretty smart, you would go talk to Socrates and see if Socrates could poke holes in your arguments. And people would go and watch. Now, not everybody's going to find this very entertaining, but there's no TV on or anything. So uh, there's going to be a certain number of people who are going to go and watch Socrates uh, ask questions of people as entertainment. And the type of people who went to follow Socrates tended to be uh, young men, because girls aren't allowed to leave their houses, and they tended to be wealthy young men because they didn't have other things to do. If you were a 16-year-old son of a stonemason, chances are you're working on Saturday afternoon. Uh, but if you were the wealthy son of a wealthy person who didn't have a lot else to do, that's the kind of person who was attracted to Socrates. That's the kind of pe person who followed him around and was very interested and excited by this. And it was very entertaining. And they'd follow him and they'd watch him and they're like, hey, well, Socrates is going to talk to someone. So, and you can just imagine what would happen afterwards. This is why he was accused of corrupting the youth. Uh, these people would watch this and realize that he had talked the priest into a circle where he couldn't understand, couldn't explain what it was to be pious, or he couldn't understand what the nature of the gods was, or the politician couldn't explain why democracy was better than anything else, or whatever else. Uh, Socrates uh, sort of illuminated the weaknesses of other people's understanding and of course they go running home because they're young kids well, not little but you know they're teenage kids they go running home and the first person they're going to ask these questions of because they just saw Socrates do this they're going to bring this out at the dinner table and be like hey dad I got a question for you as you can imagine this was deeply annoying to people and it was also deeply suspicious to Athenians after the collapse of the 30 tyrants because Socrates was challenging. That was his whole deal. He challenged everything. He challenged people's assumption about the right kind of government. He challenged people's assumption about the right kind of religion. He challenged people's assumptions about everything. And for decades in Athens, they just put up with it. They're like, yeah, that's kind of annoying, but eh, what can you do? But now they're feeling very brittle and they decide we can't put up with Socrates anymore. And so he's executed. So Socrates' most famous student is a fellow by the name of Plato. And Plato is arguably the most influential long-term uh, philosopher of the ancient world. Uh, his ideas are going to impact thousands and thousands and thousands of other writers and philosophers, and then through them, millions and millions of people. Um, they're going to have deep impact on religious systems. It, they're just going to be massively culturally influential. And so I'm going to try to give you the shortest version I can, just a basic primer on Plato. Now, he does leave lots of writing behind, so we understand his thought process a lot better than we do Socrates, or we have to kind of piece together based on what Plato says, uh, what Socrates was all about. Plato goes beyond. He comes up with a very formalized um, philosophical system. Philosophy means lover of wisdom. That's what philosopher means. A sophist is a wise guy, in essence. A philosopher is a lover of wisdom. And a philosopher like Socrates will, uh, or Plato, both, will 
distance themselves from a sophist by saying that they're not out to teach people how to make a good argument. They're out to uncover the truth with a capital T. And for both Socrates and Plato, now Socrates just asked question after question after question. That's what the Socratic method was. Plato believes strongly, according to his writing, if we can trust what he says, and I don't see why we couldn't, that there is a truth with a capital T, that the universe has defined uh, laws, that it has defined truth in it, but that the physical is fundamentally not the same as the world of mathematical purity, of mathematical truth. There is a truth, but it exists not in the physical world, but in the metaphysical world. Metaphysics means beyond physics in Greece, in Greek, I guess, Greece too. Um, but um, Plato argues that there is something known as dualism, uh, that there is a division between the physical and the spiritual, the world of feeling and the world of reason, that these are separate. And of the two, it's the world of reason. It's the world of thought. It's the world of mathematics. It's the world of the spirit where truth exists. And the physical is nothing but a very poor and shaky reflection of that truth. So this idea that you can divide the world into the physical and the spiritual is going to be one of the more kind of long lasting and far reaching uh, elements of platonic thought. Beyond that, um, he's also going to get into a lot of ideas that end up being very influential. For, for instance, when Plato says there's a difference between the physical and where everything is imperfect and the world of perfection, which is the world of ideas, he describes something known as forms. And this is how he says and how he claims people can understand the truth. Plato argues that the only way to know something in its purest sense is through reason and logic, that the human mind can reach for the truth, but you can't do it through empirical observation. You can't do it by trusting the experience of your senses because your senses are uh, grounded in the body and the body is fallible. The body is flawed. You can only uncover the truth through things like mathematics. Uh, you can only uncover truth through reason and the mind and rationality. And that's the only way forward. It's the only way you can do it. So when I say the world of the forms, what he argues is that everything that exists in the physical world is a shaky copy, a sort of a poor representation of something that we have an image in our head of. So uh, this is hard to do without making a lot of gestures, but if you can imagine a table, right? Um, and I point to a table in front of me. Plato would say, you recognize this as a table because in your mind exists this mental category, this mental form of the idea of what essentially makes up a table. And you can recognize the one in front of you as being a version of that perfected table. So even though the physical copy can never really be perfect and never can really fully match up to that, what you should concentrate on is this perfect image. You should concentrate on the form itself, what makes a table a table, the essence of tablehood. All right, this was probably complicated, so I'll, I'll pick something else. All right, so imagine, for instance, mathematics. He's like, this is the purest example of the difference between uh, physical world and the spiritual world, physical world and the rational world. Two plus two, for instance, equals four. It always does. It does it perfectly. No matter how many times you make that equation, it always comes out the same. And it comes out perfectly the same. That's mathematics. That's perfection. That's reason. That exists only in the world of reason, and so that works out perfectly. But if you were to take that and translate it to the physical world, if you were to take two apples and another two apples and add them up, that equals four apples, and the math part is perfect. Two apples plus two apples equals four apples. Two plus two equals four. But one apple can never truly be identical to another apple. So this four apples may look nothing like a different four apples. 
once you actually take the perfect math and try to translate it into the imperfect world, then disparities sneak in, then imperfections sneak in. It doesn't ever perfectly translate. So you have to try to turn your back on distraction. You have to turn your back on physical sensation and not trust it. You don't trust the information that's coming from your eyes. You don't trust the information that's coming from your kind of gut feeling or impulses. Instead, you have to discipline your mind and concentrate on logic and reason and rationality and separate that perfect capital T truth away from the imperfect physical manifestation that is the world we live in. So this and a whole bunch of other stuff ends up being enormously, hugely influential in philosophical thought. And Plato's ideas are going to echo and echo and echo down the ages. Okay, this is a Renaissance painting, by the way. Uh, so it's funny because you have all these uh, Greek philosophers all assembled and uh, they're in a very Renaissance Italian hall. Okay, that being said, Plato was Socrates' most famous student. So Plato's most famous student is this guy, Aristotle, a little younger. He lives from 384 to 322 BC, and he also is going to be massively influential on the people who follow after him, not just other thinkers and philosophers. This isn't just a history of philosophy class. He's included because he's going to be massively influential on historical figures in the political realm as well, as well as massive cultural movements and everything along those lines. Aristotle's a bit more practical than Plato. Plato talks about the world of the forms. He talks about the, the dualism, the distinction between the physical and the rational, the physical and the spiritual. Aristotle doesn't really contradict any of that, but he puts a much more practical spin on it. He comes along and says, okay, all right, fine. Maybe there's a distinction, in fact, there is a distinction between, you know, what we think of as tablehood, the essence of being a table, and every individual table you meet. But you don't have to just assume that there's automatically some kind of divinely inspired form, essence of table in your mind planted in there. If you want to know what makes a table a table, you look at every one you can come across. You look at them all. And you ask yourself, what do they have in common? What about this is what makes it a table? You come up with, drum roll, categories. And you can fit things inside of categories based on the qualities that they have. And you can do this in basically every part of life. You can have categories that define furniture. You can have categories that define anything. You can have categories that define, and this is if you've studied biology or zoology in school, uh, the whole like categorization system with the like the species and, and family and phylum and all that kind of stuff. This is in part an, uh, an out an expansion of the ideas that Aristotle puts in place. Now, he is not the greatest biologist in the world, but he definitely sort of innovates the whole discipline. The idea that you can understand the world by examining a lot of things figuring out what they have in common, and then creating categories based on those commonalities that you can fit things into or not. So he's going to apply this idea to basically everything, not just biology and zoology and botany, where you definitely expect it. He's also going to explore things like logic, ethics, physics, metaphysics, um, music, theater, aesthetics, poetry, psychology, linguistics, politics, and government. And he's going to look at all of them and say, all right, well, what do they have in common? What it makes a thing one thing versus another? And then let's look practically at whether one is better than the other. If you had to study logic in math class ever, those rules come to us basically straight from Aristotle, where he examined what makes an argument a valid argument and what makes an argument a flawed argument. Let's make a list of what the logical fallacies are and see whether things fall into them or don't. And the same thing goes with politics. Now, Plato had had a, a discussion of politics as well. And we'll discuss this a little bit in our uh, meeting, our Zoom meeting. Uh, and he writes something called the Republic. So that's Plato. He writes the Republic. And in it, Plato tries to break down what's the best kind of government. And he is going to examine three in real detail. He's going to talk about... Um, well, hmm. 
He's going to talk about uh, monarchy. He's going to talk about oligarchy. He's going to talk about democracy. And I take that back. He talks about four, really. He talks about something called Timarchy as well, which is the name he gives what Sparta does. Um, and then he breaks them down and analyzes which he thinks is best. And Plato's argument, once he analyzes them all, is that basically they all stink, the current forms of government he's familiar with. Uh, monarchy is bad when you have a tyrant because the tyrant inevitably becomes paranoid and afraid that everybody's out to get him because they are. And then he makes terrible decisions. And because he's just one person and he's fallible, he makes terrible emotional decisions and then bad decisions get made and the whole thing falls apart. Oligarchy is a little better because uh, wealthy people are going to look out for their own interests. And so since there's a bunch of them, they don't totally get paranoid. The downside, according to Plato, is that they're only going to look out for their own interests. So they're not going to make the best decisions for their culture, for their city, for their city state or whatever, they're going to make the best decision for themselves. And that inevitably leads to conflict. And then it breaks down. Um, democracy is bad, according to Plato, who's very bitter about the Socrates thing, uh, because uh, democracy is run by the majority and the majority of people are stupid. And so stupid people make stupid decisions. And that's just destined to fail. That's his view. Uh, then Timarchy, he says, is probably the best of them, but it's really bad because it's, it's hostile to philosophers, as it was. <laughs> so um, it doesn't have any freedom for thought, and that's no good. So Plato's solution was that the best government would be run that one that was run by the philosopher king. It would be one who was a, a monarchy, but a monarchy that wasn't just run by any old Joe. Instead, it would be run by somebody who'd been trained in philosophy, who disciplined their mind to put aside their irrational feelings and fears and paranoia and focus on doing what was ethically and morally right, seeking after truth. They'd trained themselves in that way, and so that would be the best possible government. Aristotle, his student, disagrees. Aristotle puts forward a general philosophy where he promotes the idea of something called the golden mean or the perfect average, the ideal kind of average middle. And he's like, that's really what you should be aiming for in life. You should be aiming at the middle. You don't want too much of anything. It's a little bit like wine. If you have no wine, you're sad because you have no wine and it's, it's you're thirsty and, and uh, bored. If you have too much wine, you get sick and drunk and that's no good. What you want is just enough. Uh, that's what you should aim for everywhere in life. So along with telling you what makes up the qualities of a good Greek tragedy, he'll also tell you that in politics, there is no one answer as to what makes the best government. It really just depends on what does the most good for the most people who are living in any particular political uh, institution. But he advocates this principle of the golden average. He advocates the idea that the best political government is one where it provides the greatest prosperity for the greatest number of citizens. It's the one that gives people the best balance between individual liberty and security and stability and protection. And he's like, and how that works out is really just kind of up to you. It depends on what you like. Maybe in some places that's an oligarchy. Maybe in some places that's a... a democracy, maybe in some places that would be under the rule of a benevolent tyrant. It really just doesn't matter as long as it's the system that is the one that is creating the best balance for people, doing the most good for them. So Aristotle takes Plato's ideas and he softens them down and makes them much more practical. He uh, puts forth this idea of categories that you can understand the world by using empirical observation. And in essence, you could say he's the father of the scientific method, if you really wanted to. Also of liberal philosophy, as that really centers around the same idea that Aristotle has put forward, that the best choice is the one that does the most good for the most people. Um, and so he takes it, he softens it, he makes it more practical. Now, Plato was Socrates' most famous pupil. Aristotle was Plato's most famous pupil. Uh, Aristotle's most famous pupil dun, dun, is this guy. Dun, 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 dun. If you recognize this, this is from a mosaic in Pompeii. 
And I'll give you some indication. It's a Roman mosaic. And so you can see just how influential. Now, a lot of the statues I've been showing you are actually Roman copies as well. So uh, you should, or straight up uh, made by Romans who were interested in Greek philosophers. But uh, this is a mosaic from a floor in a Roman city. And we haven't gotten to Rome yet. And we're not going to get there for a while to, to come. Just a little while, but a while to come. Because this guy's impact was so far-reaching. It was so politically, culturally, linguistically, economically, militarily uh, important that his life and exploits were uh, a popular theme for the artistic decoration of homes hundreds of years later and hundreds of miles away. This guy is Alexander the Great. Now, at the time that Aristotle was his tutor, he wasn't Alexander the Great yet. He was the son of a fellow by the name of Philip of Macedon. Macedon, if you look at the map, is that blue region to the north of Greece. And it was a kind of a very loose uh, confederation where you have a bunch of uh, different very small city-states that are organized into uh, different regions under the overlordship of a king, technically. But this king of Macedon was much more like the kings you see in the Iliad than anything you would see in the city-states to the south. Um, he was much more a leader of other warlords, is, is how it worked. And... Um, he's going to come to power kind of slowly and gradually on the fringes of Greece's awareness to the north, but he's going to have exciting and thrilling ambitions. And we'll talk about the king of Macedon, Philip, in just a moment. So what happens in Greece uh, after the Peloponnesian War, and this is what we're going to wind up with today. What happens in Greece after the Peloponnesian War is over. Athens and Sparta had fought each other. Athens lost. Sparta won. They put in the 30 tyrants. Then Athens overthrew the 30 tyrants. They execute Socrates and they begin rebuilding. Now, people aren't stupid. They don't get fall. They don't fall for that Delian League thing again. But the idea of Sparta being unchallenged and having no rival for power on uh, Greece was not popular either. And so slowly and carefully, many city-states kind of join back up with Athens to create a kind of renewed alliance. This time, they don't make the mistake of just putting Athens in charge of everything and all the money, but they do throw in and start forging kind of mutual defense treaties, counterbalancing the power of Sparta again. As you can imagine, Sparta's not thrilled about this. They are also starting to get nervous and call in allies. Now, part of the reason so many uh, places were willing to turn their back on Sparta and join up with Athens, who was a big troublemaker to begin with, is because Sparta makes no secret of the fact that they're chummy, buddy-buddy, with the Persians. And that really ticks off a lot of other Greek city-states, including the one that's kind of to the north of almost immediately to the north of where Athens is. It's in the yellow region, the bright yellow region, Thebes. Thebes does not want to have anything to do with Persia or Persian power. And so they are suspicious of Sparta and they form an alliance with Athens uh, to Sparta's uh, detriment to, to kind of counterbalance the power of Sparta. As you can imagine, and you don't have to remember the details of this, but war inevitably breaks out. But this time it's a three-way thing. You have Athens, you have Sparta, you have Thebes. And because it's a three-way thing, um, it doesn't have a clear and decisive outcome. It just kind of rages on and on and on and eats up resources. But particularly, it changes the balance of power because Thebes has been making all kinds of innovations. They have a military leader by the name of Epaminondas. And Epaminondas uh, has been making some changes to the way that Thebes' army works. They've been using longer spears uh, the way that Sparta does, so erasing Sparta's advantage in that way. The reason everybody doesn't just do this is because it takes a lot more training to be able to manage a longer spear. It's just harder to do. Um, and so they begin using longer spears they also begin incorporating some cavalry which was something that almost nobody did the hoplites typically fight on foot 
But Epaminondas begins uh, experimenting with this. He also begins experimenting with using the hoplite phalanx in a slightly different way. So not always keeping them in squares, but changing their formations and maneuverability and working on things a little bit of a different way. He's a brilliant military commander. And as a result of his efforts, largely a result of his efforts, at the Battle of Leuctra in 371, Thebes is going to come up against Sparta. And this is going to be one of the most game-changing battles in the ancient Greek world because Sparta had for centuries at this point dominated uh, the sort of Greek peninsula, both the Peloponnese, the southern part, and the northern part, uh, largely by having a much better hoplite phalanx than anybody else did. Everybody fought the same way, but Sparta was inarguably the best. Anytime Sparta came up with even numbers, so if they had as many troops as their enemy, anytime that happened, or even if it was close, Sparta always won. Everybody knew that's what happened. Sparta always wins these kinds of battles. It was just expected. And yet, at the Battle of Leuctra, they were evenly matched. It was a straightforward land battle between Thebes and Sparta, and Thebes wins. They not only win, they win decisively. They slash their way through the Spartans. And then they follow that up almost immediately by uh, spreading the word that this has happened and whipping up the helots. And so the helots go into rebellion and Sparta has to go back home and try to cope with that. And it was a huge mess and it was a huge blow to Sparta. And Thebes is sitting pretty. And as you can imagine, this it was a shock, a shock to everybody in Greece because the assumption was that in an even contest, Sparta always wins. And so you would think that Athens would be delighted, right? Yay, Sparta has been crushed, except they're not. They're like, uh-oh, uh-oh, this is bad because Thebes is really our close neighbor. It's not like Sparta where they're a little bit of ways away and plus Sparta can't ever stay out of town for very long because of the helots. Thebes doesn't have any of those problems. Thebes has all these fancy new maneuvers. Thebes has the longer spears. Thebes has this good military training and Thebes has something called the sacred band. The sacred band uh, is a really interesting kind of element in military history. The thought process was, if you remember how the hoplite phalanx works, uh, the idea is that you have a big round shield that covers half of you and half of the guy next to you. And uh, Epaminondas and others in Thebes had this idea that what really motivates people to make sure that they're staying in formation properly and guarding the guy next to them as much as themselves is a concern for that person. And what would be more logical than to exploit a natural feeling. And so if you were to make up a hoplite phalanx out of homosexual couples, out of people who were in same-sex relationships and pair them up and line them up next to each other, they would be strongly motivated to make sure they're protecting their partner as much as themselves. And this would make them much more fearsome in battle because they also don't want to look, look like a loser in front of their uh, boyfriend. And so um, this would make them ferocious warriors and much better hoplite phalanxes than any other kind of system. And so he creates a hoplite phalanx, several of them, that's made up this way. And he calls it the sacred band. And in fact, they are fearsome fighters and extremely effective. So what happens at the, as a result of this, after the battle of Leuctra, Thebes comes out on top and everybody else is like, uh oh, this has changed everything because Thebes is so powerful, but they don't have any of Sparta's disadvantages. So now we're scared of Thebes. So Athens starts backing out and they're like, uh-oh, this is a problem. We don't want Thebes to get too powerful. So they sneak around behind Thebes' back and form an alliance with Sparta. Sparta, who they hate. And they then go after Thebes. And then it just goes around and around and around in this just crazy circle where they're constantly making and breaking alliances where two will gang up on the other. And then they just kind of keep fighting and they fight 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 till all three, Athens, Sparta, Thebes are ground into the ground. And then comes this guy, Philip of Macedon. Now we'll talk about his background and his uh, expertise more next time, but I can tell you this. He spends a good deal of his youth as a political hostage. This is something they did in the ancient world quite a lot. He spends a good deal of his youth as a political hostage living in 
Thebes. And because relations went pretty well with Macedon and Thebes, Philip was treated really well. And he was given a great deal of military education. And he was treated very politely. And he had a good re relationship, in fact, with Epaminondas, <laughs> the military commander that had been making all of these innovations in Thebes. He's going to take that expertise back to Macedon and consolidate his control over that kingdom. We'll talk about how he does that and the impact of it later. But here is where we're going to leave off. Athens, Sparta, and Thebes have been fighting this decades-long war where they are exhausting themselves. They are emptied. Their treasuries are empty. Their, their phalanxes are depleted. Their resources are ground down to nothing. They have been fighting and fighting and fighting and getting nothing from it. And now they're all in tatters, smoking. Uh, they're not quite in ruins, but there is just uh, miserable situation in all three of these places. Meanwhile, Philip of Macedon has been having all kinds of success pulling the kingdom of Macedon from being a loose collection of warlords into a single centralized kingdom. And we'll talk about how the two are going to interact with each other next time. Thank you very much, and I'll see you then.